Hello, my name's Tony. I have to lose weight, and this is my vlog. What is up, everybody? Welcome to a Friday. Welcome to our first uh, foray into looking at this book here, The Power, the Power of Habit. Uh, this is the book that we're reading. We're going to do one chapter a week, and today's assignment uh, was to have read chapter one. Uh, I read chapter one. I highlighted chapter one, and uh, I've pondered chapter one. And man, this is a strong chapter. It's called The Habit Loop. And uh, it's, the, of course, the foundational chapter for this book, and it sets up some very key things. Uh, the way the chapter is structured is first the author, uh, Charles Duhigg, I don't know if I'm saying that right, the author wants us to understand the science that goes behind studying habits. Uh, the habit loop, this chapter, again, it's going to be foundational. He tells the story, he recounts the history of how a couple key subjects help scientists understand how memory works, how parts of the brain affect that, things like the hippocampus, when the hippocampus is uh, removed or damaged, we lose the ability to uh, have short-term memory, uh, to retain things for long periods of time. But then he also talks about this other thing called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is something that's deep in the brain, close to the brain stem. The, the basal ganglia he talks about it being something that, that's old when it comes to the brain. He talks about how when we learn new things and think about new things, they live on kind of the top of our brain and some of those folds, but this basal ganglia lives deep in the brain and it, it stores things and it stores routines and it, it's really the kind of the power source for habits. And the interesting thing that comes out of studying the hippocampus and brain injury and people with memory loss and studying the basal ganglia is that it becomes evident that there's this thing called the habit loop. Uh, the chapter goes into some pretty interesting information about how they experiment with rats, like uh, little tiny surgery, uh, putting diodes in rats' heads so that they can understand what goes on when they're trying to learn something. And the studying of rats is interesting because it tells us a little bit about how our brain works when we're trying to learn something new. Uh, they monitored the brain activity of these rats as they tried to make their way through a maze and find a piece of chocolate, a T-shaped maze. And what they discovered is uh, in the beginning, as the rat tried to find the chocolate their brain is just going crazy all this brain activity boop 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 the brain working hard to find the chocolate but they left the chocolate in the same place they let them run the same maze over and over and they did something interesting they had a wall and then they would buzz and the wall would come up and then they would run the maze and they found that over time the rats could run that maze really quickly and get to the chocolate but as they studied their brain activity they realized that the more that they ran the maze uh, the brain activity decreased. So they start to flesh out this idea that the brain wants to conserve energy. And so the way to conserve energy is to take things that are routine and kind of put them in a, like if it's a computer parlance, put it into a macro or put it into a, uh, you know, like a sub process, uh, just where they would take a bunch of instructions and put it together, call it one thing, and then they could just run that one routine. And, and that's what our brain does. They called it chunking in the book here that, that we take these routines, we put them in a chunk and it takes less brain energy to execute the chunk once it's established than, to, uh, to have all this high brain activity. So the first point that the book's trying to make is that our brain is super efficient and its goal is to work less, to work smarter, not harder. And it does this by taking things that are routine and putting them uh, into these chunks that can be executed in our brain. It does sound a little bit like a computer. Now, the interesting thing is they continue to study this. They start to call it the habit loop, and they realize that there's three parts to the habit loop. There is a cue, there is an execution of the routine, and then there is a reward. And all that information is stored in that basal ganglia next to our brainstem. So again, if we use a computer analogy, these are uh, programs that are basically written that are sitting in our uh, you know supercomputer to be executed, and we don't call them up by our own thought it's just the cue that calls them up so like for the rats when they heard the little buzzer and the partition go up that was the cue to execute the run the maze uh, routine and then get the reward it sounds pretty simple but when you start thinking about it in our own life in our own context 
it makes a whole lot of sense. The one that always comes to mind is once you've worked somewhere for a long time and say you commute, you drive home every day. I know there have been many days when I would go from my work to my home that I would have no consciousness of the drive home, that I would just be somewhere at my brain would uh, focus on something else. I would think about something else and I would make all of the motions of driving home and I would never, I, I couldn't even recount what had happened. I, I've had that sensation several times like, wow, how did I get here? I know I just drove home. But that's kind of the idea that that routine of how I drive home, the different cues along the way, firing off all these little routines kind of get me home without even thinking about it. Now, they do talk about that your brain's constantly working and it's constantly checking so that if things do happen, like cars come into your periphery, uh, you know, if some danger happens that all of a sudden you're snapped out of that routine and you're back into active brain. But yeah, I see that happening. A more recent uh, circumstance is, you know, we do a live show on our other YouTube channel and uh, we do that every Tuesday night. And we got in this routine since we moved to Florida that after we would do the live show, we would go to the McDonald's that is a, like a, a mile down the road and we get double cheeseburgers. And so uh, what's interesting as we've started to fast, try to lose weight this week, uh, be more focused on our health. We've, we've had that scenario where, okay, we finished the live show. That's the cue. Uh, like without even thinking, our brain is saying, okay, we have to go get the cheeseburgers and then that way we can get the reward. Uh, the interesting thing now is we're having to say to ourselves, okay, there's the cue. The show is over. Uh, let's go get cheeseburgers. And then we're having to say no to that. The, the really big nuggets that come out of this chapter to me is that uh, these habits that you make, they, they don't go away. And uh, so they're always there. Because sometimes I wonder, like, how do I fall into these old habits? Say, I'm, uh, say I was on Weight Watchers. I was on Weight Watchers for like eight months. And I did great. And I lost 80 pounds. And then I, I stopped doing the things that I was doing on Weight Watchers. And almost immediately, the old habits of bad eating, the old habits of being sedentary, they came back. And I didn't really have to relearn them. And what the book would argue is that they were always there. That presents a problem for us. That means that the habits that we learn, both good and bad, are always there waiting to be activated. And it really starts to make an emphasis on what cues that we're using to fire off those routines. Now, the beautiful thing is uh, it, nothing's set in stone, that we can tweak these routines, that we can change the habit loop, but a lot of it is hardwired. And the point is that we have to recognize the things that are hardwired that are not good for us and, and make a change to it. Because the, you know, the interesting thing is once it's locked into the habit loop, uh, we can execute that stuff without even thinking. Uh, another example, if if I sit down on the couch after I do my work a little bit, uh, that's a cue for me to just chill out. And if I don't do something to break that you know, uh, routine, I can lay on the couch the whole rest of the day. And so I have to forcibly make myself get up. Like this week, for example, my routine is I'll get up, I'll work on videos, I do things. And then when we finally have our lunch break, like at one o'clock or something like that, we'll have lunch. Maybe we'll watch a TV show that we're binging together. And if I, if I don't get up at that point, I can stay there the whole day. But now I've been trying to uh, put a different, you know, habit in place by uh, going swimming in the pool or doing another video or doing some more work, that kind of thing. I was doing that without even reading the book. I didn't realize that basically I was trying to disrupt my habit, but uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating because you can start looking in your life for the cues that are, are your cues for bad habits, and you can start to try to determine ways to reprogram them. Let me give you some of the quotes that I really liked. So I, I did a, a lot of highlighting. That's kind of how I do it, uh, and it helps me learn. I think I've given you a, a of course, some of the big nuggets from the highlights, but there was one that was particularly, okay, so if we look on page 25 toward the end of the chapter, this is kind of the summation statement uh, of all the things that are talked about in chapter one. Read chapter one. Uh, man, I, it was emotional at the end because they talk about the, the patient that they used to learn a lot of this and how his life kind of ended, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was heavy, so it's definitely a good read. But this is, the, this is the nugget I want to close the video out on. Habits are powerful but delicate. They can emerge outside our consciousness or can be deliberately designed. They often occur without our permission but can be reshaped by fiddling with their parts. They shape our lives far more than we realize. They are so strong, in fact, that they can cause our brains to cling to them at the exclusion of all else, including common sense. 
it's it's wild. And and if you take all those pieces there that if you do something, if you follow the same cue and you do something without thought, that can become a habit. You can also very directly alter your habits and we'll follow them even if it doesn't make sense. And just think about things in your life where that's true. Uh, again, overeating, for example, you know, we set ourselves up in these cycles where uh, we do one thing. Like for me, I always want a dessert at the end of my meal. It doesn't make sense. I don't necessarily need it. But now my brain's programmed that, okay, I ate a meal. Now I need to eat something sweet. And it's there. And so uh, I, I don't know if that happened. It didn't happen by design. I wasn't like, oh, maybe I can consume extra sugar every day by having a dessert after every meal. But it did become part of my habit. And so now I have to actively work against that. And I think the book's going to give us some tools on how to actively work against that. And, and then the other thing that I thought was uh, essential and something that we can all start doing by learning to observe the cues and rewards, though, we can change the routines. And so habit loop is cue, uh, routine, and reward. And that's the thing. We've got to know what triggers the habit, what are the steps that happen inside the routine, and then what's the reward that we're trying to get to. And by understanding those components, we can start to build habits that will be beneficial for us while rejecting the ones that are not beneficial for us. Just a couple questions out there based on that. What are some cues, if you think about it, what are some cues that uh, that turn on routines that go toward bad behavior? Like me, simple thing, ending the show on Tuesday night, now I got to have a hamburger. Do you have any cues like that? And then what are some things that you do uh, subconsciously like me driving home? Is there anything that's just routine to you? They talk about things like brushing your teeth, backing out of the driveway, stuff like that. But can you think of any examples? Let's have a conversation. What are some of the nuggets? that you got out of chapter one. Uh, I hope you find this helpful. We're just working on our mind and our body. I hope everybody's doing good. I'm down a few pounds already this week uh, from the intermittent fasting and from working out 30 minutes a day. Working out is probably a strong word from moving 30 minutes a day. Hope you guys are doing good out there. My name's Tony. I got to lose weight. This is my vlog. And uh, yeah, we'll see you for a weigh-in on Monday. Oh yeah, and don't forget uh, chapter two next Friday. Bye.